You're listening to the Braver Angels Podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, John Wood Jr. Okay, so I'm very excited about today's episode of the Braver Angels podcast. I am joined by two extraordinary, empathetic, compassionate, brilliant, and wonderful actresses. Um, I'll have to ask them how they feel about that term, because sometimes (laughs) when I say actress, I get correct and say, no, no, it's actors for everyone. And so that's a good way of segueing into the fact that this is a political conversation. Uh, But nevertheless, I am joined today by Miss Lydia Cornell and Roxanne beckford Hogue. And uh, Roxanne is a, uh, let me just go through our quick little bios here. Uh, Roxanne is a former Republican Party candidate for the California State Assembly, representing, seeking to represent District 46. She's also, of course, an actress who was born in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, she is known in part for her work in A Different World, Bewitched, Something's Gotta Give, and Father of the Bride 2. Uh, Lydia Cornell, on the other hand, is a woman and children's rights activist, author, public speaker, and actress, of course. She is best known for her role as Sarah Rush on ABC's Too Close for Comfort and is a People's Choice Award winner. Her great-great-grandmother was Harriet Beecher Stowe. She has been invited to contribute her writings to the International Museum of Peace, which houses letters from Nobel laureate, uh, from Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Uh, Roxanne, Lydia, how are you two doing today? Pretty good. So happy to be here and finally meet you. I really admire Braver, Braver Angels. And it used to be Better Angels. I joined you a long time ago. Mm. But I really admire what you're doing. Mm. Thank you so Important much. Stuff. Thank you so much. And I'm always happy to be with you you, John, but super flattered um, <laughs> to know that Lydia is related to Harriet Beecher. So that's like, <laughs> that's like big time now. So. <laughs> yeah, right. She's my hero, one of my female heroes. Yeah, that is pretty, yeah. a pre- pretty amazing, amazing thing. So yeah, well, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Um, but just to just to get us started here. Okay, so first of all, uh, what what is the proper uh, terminology? Should I be saying actress? Should I be no. saying actor? Okay. I wrote a whole comedy routine on this because I, mm. I turn every tragedy into comedy. That's how okay. I deal with life. It's through humor. Mm. But um, you don't call a lawyer a lawyeress or a doctor a doctoress or an mm. account accountant an accountress. So mm. actor, you know, why it, the only words with the trust ending are waitress, mistress, and adulteress. Mm. <laughs> That's a joke. That's supposed to be funny. <laughs> I'm and, laughing. And stewardess and mistress. Oh, stewardess. And, uh, you know, and I guess I guess we'll start off with the divide right now. Yeah. Uh, like the old joke says, don't, you know, just don't call me Shirley. Ca- call me anything as long as the check clears and SAG, uh, <laughs> and I make my SAG insurance. <laughs> so I don't care. Um, yeah. I'm okay with actor or actress because I am. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I mean, that really is a perfect place to start, though, right? Because you have so much of what I think is difficult about politics today is the fact that I think that the you know, and it is not to cast a judgment on, on either side, but there seem to be so many sort of like rules for how we ought to be thinking and talking about issues and so forth. So many ways for us to trigger, you know, a, a tough or defensive responses in each other that a lot of times people just feel like, well, I, I don't I don't know the rules. And so right. you know, I think you get two reactions that come from that. One is sort of like defensiveness or aggressiveness, right, where we can be right. very offended and want to attack people or People say, I'm not going to play. I'm not going to participate. If I vote, I'm not going to tell anybody who I voted for. Let me get as far away from these sorts of conversations as I can, which is also not good because we got to talk, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Lydia, I'll just start with you really quick. I mean, just what do you make of the whole environment, you know? Well, I believe all human suffering is caused by Victoria's Secret. <laughs> so I actually believe it's, it's rooted in advertising years ago in the 80s. I, I was a sex symbol on TV mm. and they chose me and they put me in bikini posters on, on the network. And I had to, listen, I got in trouble for eating starch. In those days, they called it starch. I oh, bought yeah. a, a, a taco, a burrito and a bag of M&Ms on the food truck. We were at KTLA Studios filming Too Close for Comfort in the beginning. And I was rail thin, but... The producer saw me and he says, don't, you're a sex symbol. You can't eat starch. And I, the food was <laughs> flying in the air and I went crying to my dressing room and I was oh, on no. a constant diet and I didn't, thank God, I, you know, a lot of good came out of not worrying too much about it. I learned how to manage it without bulimia, but it's a, 
we were put into a mold in the 80s and women had to look a certain way. And we were also fighting this juxtaposition of the women's liberation movement, which kind of ended when Reagan came to power. So I have a lot of theories on this whole, this whole thing. I think advertising made our culture feel that women are a free for all. Women are sex objects and that's what they're good for. And I can't really blame the men who grew up in that era and annihilate them now for the Me Too era. Mm. I have a really um, different philosophy of the whole thing. I think advertising, it's a plot to keep us thin and insecure. So we buy products, mm. you know? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I think a lot of people are going to relate to that. Um, Roxanne, yeah. I, yeah. Well, jump in, Roxanne. I mean, what do you think of well, that? Would, and do you see anything else in addition to that? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, I don't want to be a member of the Church of the Perpetually Offended. And a lot of times people <laughs> will use things, whatever their salient point is about them, to, to cover up for things that have happened in their life. For example, I could say you know what, uh, I, I don't get work since I've said I'm a conservative. And the, okay, the fact is that once I focused on my children, um, I took a hiatus from Hollywood. Uh, women of a certain age don't get that many jobs. So I'm not gonna pretend it's something that's not. Sadly, I had to be willing to say, I had to make peace with the fact that there's a very high likelihood that I would lose work by being um, just out as a Republican or a conservative. Wow. But I'm not going to say that something causes something just in the same way yeah. that I teach my children. If, if somebody looks at you funny um, or has a problem with you, uh, it's not your race. It may be that they're constipated. It may <laughs> be that they are not. And this is the truth. Other people aren't thinking about you at all. Right. Most of us live in our own heads. So when I hear um, a movement rise up and say, you know, police everywhere are going against uh, black people when they pull them over, they're just trying to get home and they'd like to see your license and registration. So give it to them and move on. Hmm. I just, I, um, in 1994, I had a, a crash and burn and a spiritual awakening and I got sober. I'm 26 years sober hmm. by the grace of God. Congratulations. And I, one of my one of my joke lines. I had a feud with Ann Coulter back in two thousand and five when I was hosting a radio show in Vegas, a political <clears throat> radio show. We had all the senators and House of Representatives on, the Congress people, and the White House, a lot of uh, the Attorney General Gonzalez, and we we discussed. One of my favorite women is Carolyn Maloney. She's a representative from New York, and she wrote a book called "Rumors of Our Progress Have Been Highly Exaggerated" mm -hmm. about women and human trafficking. And I became a little political back then, trying to stop the Iraq war. And I was against Bush. Now I really like, I've come, I've become much more moderate. My my joke line is, <laughs> I went from ego-driven tightwad to human, to, um, to humanitarian. In other words, I was a Republican and then I got sober. I was a Reagan Republican. Mm. And I started to develop deep love for humanity. And, and, and it sounds corny. It sounds like I'm a bleeding heart liberal, but I began to, become more of a Christian when I became sober and I found God. Mm. So I said, I can't be, after listening to Rush Limbaugh for so many years on talk radio in the kitchen, I went, he is against teachers unions. He's against public parks. He's against saving the rainforest. He's against the environment and all the things I think help America that help our common good, not socialism. It's our taxes should go for the things that help the common good. Mm fire department of uh, you know military police public parks clean water safe highways schools libraries and th that's not socialism but somewhere along the way we became a corporate country where the corporations became the ones on welfare we have corporate welfare and the middle class got screwed out of the deal in the 80s it started so i'm really a moderate to tell you the truth and mm. we're probably this is segueing into too many different directions but no this is good this is good well, and that's fascinating because I, I would also call myself a common sense moderate and I went the opposite way. So I was a complete bleeding heart liberal. I wasn't a citizen when he ran, but I still volunteered and helped um, Bill Clinton's um, campaigns. Um, I remember being in the Barbara Boxer campaign office when I first moved to California. And then I, a couple things happened. Um, I started paying attention 
to um, the debates in, in 2000, I remember, and Al Gore was, was all over the place and, and changing personalities like suits. And <laughs> George, uh, George W. Bush made some sense to me as well. And then I put my son in public school and all of a sudden the bromides that I had heard came crashing down around me. They didn't need more money. They needed to act like education was important. And the parents who are there need to act like education is important. And it's funny because I listened to Rush Limbaugh. Um, he was just on in my kitchen while I was doing my dishes because my dishwasher has been broken for two weeks. <laughs> <gasps> That's okay. I'm sure the new one will show up one day. And no one's against that. The, the, I will agree with you, Olivia, that crony capitalism is a horrible thing. I mean, I remember... You know, when movie villains went from guys who wanted to rule the world to all of a sudden this amorphous, corporate, faceless uh, mm -hmm. CEO, it's kind of there. Like, those guys are way scarier. What Google knows about you and I is way, and what they can do with that information is way scarier than anything the U.S. government could have dreamed up. But I do, I think... Mm -hmm. The classic distinction between liberal and conservative is what you think the government should do. And I'm pretty sure Rush Limbaugh also likes clean air and clean water and parks and public libraries, as do I. In fact, coming from Jamaica um, and being a total nerd, mm -hmm. I love libraries. They're, they were my saving grace as a kid. You can get any book, get any information before mm -hmm. Google, you go to see the reference librarian. And now in Los Angeles, where I live, you can't go to a public library. I know. Because so they smell of pee and oh. human excrement because well, okay. we then, no longer have a government that works in Los but Angeles. But if all. Reagan hadn't taken the mentally ill people off the streets and closed the state institutions, which helped when capitalism became, what I, I know Reagan and Clinton's responsible too for NAFTA, but when Reagan outsourced jobs, manufacturing, and, and fought the unions, it stopped the American labor from being able to make a living wage. And women had to go to work too, more than ever before. And then childcare at home, it became, we became a neurotic nation. But the um, outsourcing of jobs, Jack Welch, GE, outsourced jobs to Thailand and bragged about getting labor for 50 cents a day. That is not American, that's greed. That's the greed era of the eighties. So I came up in that era and I was, you know, I was so spoiled. Tom Hanks and I went on a trip across America to Mount Rushmore and all across to all the ABC affiliates doing a, a tour. He was on a show called Bosom Buddies on ABC and I was on Too Close for Comfort. And I was so spoiled, I wouldn't fly coach. <laughs> I was like wearing my sunglasses, hitting bonbons and a mint coat in the limousine going, we can't, I, I can't go coach. Mm. I was such a, a asshole, you know, <laughs> in those days. And I remember having just such a greedy narcissistic mentality and I feel like I really had a great leveling happen to me when I woke up and I realized the worst thing happening in America right now is media distorting the truth. Mm. And I have to say, I got these bizarre messages the other day from a woman saying, you're, if you're a Democrat, then you're a pedophile and you're on adenochrome. And I went, what's adenochrome? And she, apparently it's this drug that liberals are eating from the adrenal glands of children. I have never heard anything so sick in my life. What I look at Republican Party as when I grew up in it was the, jaw, the movie Jaws. They don't mind if you go in the shark in the ocean while the shark can while the shark can eat you as long as it saves money for the corporation. Mm. That's more or less what I think uh, is the problem today: is that they're camouflaging their true motives. I we need to come together and we need to speak with humor and love toward each other, and we need to stop stop looking at our fellow man as the enemy. I need to stop in my mind first, thinking bad thoughts about Republicans, conservatives, or people that I think are wrong. I'm very good friends with lots of police chiefs. I have very good friends in the military, went on a USO trip, trip to Beirut in the 80s. I meet with these people every year for the USS Inchon reunion. We are of all colors and stripes. Not all liberals are, you know, Antifa, whatever that is. Mm. That's not even an organized group. That's my little spiel okay. right now. So there's, there's her little spiel. Sorry, my kids are trying to um, interrupt me individually. Uh, can I can I just can I just say, Roxanne, just very very quickly that this is 
this is like the easiest moderating uh, job I've ever had, <laughs> I think, because the conversation between I, I almost don't want to interrupt. Roxanne, go ahead and say whatever you want to say. But I do have a couple of other questions uh, for, for each of you related to how it is, what your experiences have looked like dealing with folks um, on, on the other side. Right. Because Lydia said some yeah. some wonderful things about wh- the type of relationships we want to have with each other as Americans. And so we want to get to that. But Roxanne, you've got something else to say for us. So go for I, it. Well, I think it's important that we unpack what Lydia said, because couched in all the good things that we can totally agree on, that we're human and we want to believe, were a couple of throwaways about how Republicans are hiding their true motives. And basically they're sort of evil Nazis uh, in a nutshell. Oh. And so... And and I hear that a lot, like, well, you're nice, but what Republicans want to do is for children to get raped and people to get killed and everyone to die, right? Isn't that what they believe? And the truth is, no, everyone's platforms, if we're just looking at parties, and and believe me, I get it because I used to think Republicans were evil Nazis too. Um, You can actually look at a platform. You can look at a Republican Party platform. You can look at a Democrat Party platform. And... It's, it's all there in black and white. And, and I had the privilege and, well, privilege. Eh, when you get involved with party politics, it's sort of like stabbing your eyes with some sort of like, <laughs> ice picks. So is it a privilege or just some sort of duty? I'll go with sense of duty. Um, so I got to work on the California Republican Party platform, which was fascinating. And people should read them. They should absolutely read them. The Republican platform and philosophy boils down to, it only, and it only works because we are a constitutional republic and America is a high trust society, or it was. In other words, I trust that, when, that someone's word is their bond. And corporations are separate from the US government. And I don't think greed is a Republican or a Democrat, um, value because there are people who are like you were Lydia before you found sobriety who are just all about me 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 but this country and why I fled a country that was being taken over by democratic socialism and mob rule and why my family had to get out with only the equivalent of fifty dollars to each of us and my mother was surrounded by a mob of people who wanted to rip her out of her car and tear her physically apart for voting for the wrong person is that Americans, by and large, are very good people. And capitalism is what leads to innovation that will save lives. Capitalism will will make and has risen so many boats and has done great things. America wouldn't have been able to help Africa in the way that we have an entire continent um, if we didn't have capitalism. Having had the experience of going Hmm. into grocery stores with empty shelves because socialism sucks everywhere it's been tried, I I have to say that I don't have a problem with capitalism. Okay. No, that's the problem. You, I, nobody does. I love capitalism. We're being branded by the wrong names. FDR's New Deal brought Social Security and Medicare and public parks, clean water. This is the stuff that we need. They're branding liberals or, or Democrats as socialists. It's not true at all. This is the problem right now is the media, if you call it the Russian hoax or you call it the Russian hackers or you call it just cruel people trying conspiracy theories, these QAnon and all these people that are branding each other. We're branding each other with false narratives. It's wrong. I have n- Nobody I know loves abortion, likes abortion, would choose one if they didn't have to. It's a civil society. We don't have a religious law here. In other words, they're branding people as baby killers if you're a Democrat or socialists if you're a Democrat. It's the opposite. We, it's a civilized society. First, do no harm. As far as the abortion, I would never condone such a thing, but I truly believe you can't take a woman's right away to choose because we have free will in this society. Otherwise you can't punish the crime. It's the punishment that's the important part. You can't put a mother of five in prison when she has five kids at home and she had an abortion. She's gonna go to prison. You have to have a law around this. she, She may be Buddhist, she may be atheist, she may be Jewish, she may be not anything, not a Christian. We have a, You know, like Ronald Reagan says, Ronald Reagan Jr. says, our society is based on civil rights, where each person has to pursue their own dream and their own happiness, not encroaching on the rights of others. 
Mm. So anyway, I don't know why I brought up that debate because that's a really touchy subject. But I just don't want to be branded with the label socialist because I do like my Medicare and I like my Social Security and I like public schools to be funded at least. I, I do feel badly for the very poor, but I feel that if we cared about, if we brought up the bottom and collaborated more instead of competing so much, if we brought up the bottom, we'd have more people buying products and we have a more thriving economy. It's not giving out handout. It's providing real jobs and maybe putting back shop in schools, cooking classes, teaching people to make a living with, you know, there was somebody who started the program like that in the government recently. I think even Ivanka Trump thought of it. Well, Mike, um, Mike Rowe has done incredible, incredible uh, work around the dignity of, of work. And I think the other thing you said that I think can't go unaddressed because again, Reagan, he's yucky, as, as thought I, and the Lanterman Act, those those things were done on because of the ACLU. In other words, there's there's other forces working that then things happen and presidents react to them. So yeah. I think we have to look at the here and now and and not so much the branding, but in the practical effects. For example, California, for all intents and purposes, and Los Angeles County, where I am um, in particular, is 98% run by Democrats. And when people have a problem with unions, I, it, it, the language matters because what happens between the left and the right is that we're talking about different things. So when yeah. I have a problem with unions, I have a problem with public sector unions. Right. I I, I, yeah. And those huge with, pensions. With, yeah. With illegal immigration, people conflate and say that's a problem with immigration. When we talk about um, any other issue, the fact is that we have to be talking about the same thing. Well, so, so, so Reagan didn't have a problem with unions. He was a SAG mm -hmm. member, just like I am, just mm -hmm. like you are. Right. The problem is public sector unions, because what it's a it's this vicious circle where they give money, and in California, it's $2 billion every election cycle, to yeah. a party, to politicians who have no real opposition, who vote them, unending pensions at 90 80 percent of their salaries and no one has to pay the piper that's a problem yeah that's Rock, a problem roxanne right. I, I appreciate the um you drawing attention to the fact that a lot of times we think we're having a conversation about one thing and maybe we're defining terms differently right uh which makes it hard for us to arrive at some some clarity a couple of things stuck out to me as you guys were going back and forth i remember in the uh, in the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street days, which of course was you know so so far in the distant past now that none of us can 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 none of us can barely remember it. Uh, we weren't. But I up I used to. Homes. I, I know, days. right? You do you remember handshakes? I you know it's it's kind of faint <laughs> in my memory Hugs. somewhere. Yeah, you know? <laughs> Hugs. Yeah, you know. Um, no, it's, God, it really is kind of like we're in sort of like a, it, there's so many. Story, you know, dystopian storyline jokes we could make here. I shouldn't even go that way, but um, <laughs> but I was always struck by the fact that when I listened to you know protesters at the Tea Party, there was so oftentimes this this uh, uh, claim made that you know uh, we've got a problem with big businesses because they've sold out to the government. Whereas with in the Occupy Wall Street crowd, and for a lot of activists on the left, the claim was we've got a problem with government because they've sold out to big business. And in the middle yeah. of that, it seemed clear to me that, well, wait a second, uh, you know, you've got these major groups of Americans who are at war with each other because they think they have nothing in common. And yet, if you sort of drill down to, to sort of a fundamental layer, it seems clear that there's actually sort of, you know, a shared kind of shape to the concerns that a lot of folks that a lot of folks have. Right. But because I think we are so kind of ideologically pitted against each other, it's hard to arrive at that point of clarity. It's not to say that well, the differences of opinions aren't real. Right. But it does seem yeah. like we can't get to the common ground because right. the conversation doesn't allow it. So, yeah, Lydia, we, we are really you. we really want the same exact things, the same exact things. Um, Nobody wants anarchy and looters and arsonists and rioters. Those should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. They are criminals. The, uh, a friend of mine brought up the murder of Conan Hinnick, the poor little boy that was killed by a neighbor. He was murdered by a murderer. No matter what color or tribe, that's a murderer. We have to stop it saying that. Been, it, it would have been well, race were reversed. It would have been breaking news and the races would have been in the headline. But Roxanne, let, 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 no, Lydia, Roxanne let, let Lydia finish her. Let Lydia finish her point. Let Roxanne. me, let me, we'll bring let me just in. start with one. Let me go back to one initial point of view. I believe everything's economic and I believe slavery is our original sin. And we do have to 
deal with it now. We're dealing with it now piecemeal rather than at the cause. And if, if Trump or any leader would sit down and just say, I hear you, I hear your pain. Gosh, and list the names of the people killed. 164 black unarmed people were killed in the first eight months of 2020. And, and I remember Walter Scott, a father running from his car because he owed child support payments in 2016 and a cop shot him in the back. It's like, this is a true problem. And I love police. Not all of them are like that at all. It's the training that needs to be redone, re de-escalation. But the Republican Party isn't all wrong, of course. I love their work is valuable. But I remember when John McCain, and I love John McCain, by the way, John McCain and George Bush vetoed the CHIPS Act for $11 million to, to help 11 million children below the poverty line to get health insurance. I was flabbergasted. This was in 2005 or six. And they voted against it. If you can't create, jo if jobs aren't here anymore, and we only have a consumer society, we've outsourced the, the labor and the manufacturing. All we have are car salesmen, some McDonald's employees. Mm -hmm. It's hard to make a living to even have a sustainable income. And, and, and we don't have any kind of rent control really in LA where the, you know, your house went up to a million dollars. It's almost impossible to live. We just need to help a little bit to lift the bottom up. So my whole theory is if it wasn't economic, there wouldn't be people not paying their child support or, or possibly looting during Katrina. It's economic. If we could help people a little bit, it's not welfare. The welfare mom is mainly now a lot of white women on opioids. I've, I've studied this at length and I've read the hillbilly elegy and I have a deep compassion for the poverty stricken white people in the Southern states who feel that they've been left behind. Hmm. And I don't think it's fair that in Hollywood, we glorify, you know, everyone, but white people. I don't think it's, it, I mean, poor white people. You know, I think that they're feeling a little bit left out because here all these rappers are getting famous and all these athletes are getting rich and they're left behind the common man, the laborer, the coal miner. We have to start loving each other and seeing each other through the right eyes. It's the media that's screwing us up right now. Being branded, I don't brand any Republican a white nationalist or white supremacist, but that is the high, for some bizarre reason, Trump gave them a platform to feel that it's safe to talk about this stuff and to march with Nazi flags in Charlottesville and kill a woman with a car, Heather Heyer. I don't think we've ever seen that. I never thought I'd see a Nazi flag on American soil in my lifetime. Okay, I've got about 17 different questions that I could ask based <laughs> off of the yeah. exchange, that, based um, off the exchange that we just had. So Ro much to unpack. Yeah, yeah. yeah, understood, okay. Roxanne. Understood, right. and 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 uh, let me ask you a question, Roxanne. And I imagine that you will be able to weave your way over to unpacking some of what Lydia just said in this context too. Um, but you were a candidate for office, and folks, even if I hadn't mentioned that up top, might have assumed that because uh, obviously you uh, uh, are uh, ammunition is loaded, and you know how to how to rattle off uh, rattle off the arguments in in powerful fashion, right? But what I'm curious about is when you were campaigning for office, I'm guessing your your district was predominantly left-leaning, predominantly uh, uh, Democratic. In fact, I, I know your district. Um, what what were the, um, were there sort of areas of, of common ground that you were able to sort of identify with your constituents that they were surprised to, particularly on the left, that they were surprised to encounter when they actually got to know you uh, as a human being, as a neighbor, as a member of the community? Um, and whether yes or no, uh, do you have a sense of what might make it difficult for you as a candidate and as a Republican to arrive at that place of communication with folks on the other side? Well, first and foremost, the reason I can hold my own, I hope, in any sort of argument, because I have four children ranging in age from <laughs> 23 to 15-year-old twins. So um, do I don't have high approval ratings in my own house. <laughs> so um, I have to be I have to be loaded for bear every morning right. and, and ready to do battle. Mm. So, uh, so that's where I get my training. And I did um, run for office. I actually, it's a local office and I was with a lot of people I knew. Sadly, I lost more um, acquaintances, I'll call them acquaintances, but I had friend, dear friends um, say pretty hurtful, nasty things to me. Um, how could you, they didn't, uh, a lot of times they didn't know that they knew any Republicans. My kids actually attend a religious school here and I'm the den mother of a secret society of about a hundred plus 
parents who are scared, even at a well-heeled private school, to come out. And and so while Lydia is is kind and wouldn't call names um, to any of her Republican friends, there are a lot of people who do, and that's a sad, sad statement. I would say that what I think is most shocking for people, and especially when they decide they're going to have a conversation about Donald Trump, because he's the evil one and this is new. Um, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when Mitt Romney was a Nazi and also when mm. George Bush was a Nazi. Oh, no. So I kind of remember those days pretty clearly. And so it's not new. What is new and why Donald Trump got elected and fascinatingly why he is completely um, butted up against from Republican actual elites and and elected officials is because there is really one party that runs America, sort of like the uniparty, and nobody goes to Congress. Well, they go to Congress to fix things, and then they quickly realize that they go to do good, but really they're going to come out by getting good for themselves. And so they go and their their net worths explode, um, which is fascinating and I think upsets everybody. And to get back to sort of the police brutality thing. And it was actually nine unarmed black men that were shot in 2019 um, in an unjustified way. So you have to eliminate all the ones who were actually actively trying to grab for an officer weapon, run the officer down with a car or otherwise um, evade arrest in a really, really violent way. Um, So you get nine. Still bad, um, but more white guys were shot. But What's at the back? I always like to take sort of the 20,000 foot view. You know, when I hear kids screaming and I run into a room, I don't want to know who the last kid was who hit someone. I want to (laughs) know what the first thing was that was said to precipitate this thing. So what Mm -hmm. precipitates all these police interactions, funnily enough, is a lot of what happens in a lot of completely Democrat run cities, but everywhere, because that's just how government works, is the nitpicky laws. And guess what happens? How do you enforce laws, any laws, even the laws like in New York City against selling single cigarettes? Why would there be a law against selling a single cigarette? If I have a cigarette, you have a dollar. I'm grossed out by the idea, but imagine (laughs) Lydia and I on a corner and she gives me a dollar for selling her a Lucy. Mm. You make that illegal, Democrats, and that's how you get Eric Garner getting arrested. That shouldn't be a police interaction, but it's the law that starts it, right? It's the nitpicky, you can't do X, you can't do Y. When you take a shower, you better do it at 2.1 gallons per minute and not 2.5 because we're coming to get you. So all that gets piled upon itself. And economics, that's interesting. What I, what a lot of the people I ran um, to represent John discovered, and yes, it was a 14% Republican district. So it was a little bit of an uphill climb. Um, but what they found fascinating is to discover that American economic, socioeconomic status is not static. Those quintiles are constantly moving. So the top Uh, The top 20% and the bottom 20%, they're moving. People in this country, especially when you come from another one, but they don't stay somewhere unless you pay them to stay somewhere. And that's what welfare does. It pays you to stay in that bottom quintile. Roxanne, just a quick little question for you, just really quick. Uh, Do you believe that the government has a role in providing an economic floor beneath people uh, in terms of a social safety net or or something like that? Um, Or do you think that the government should be completely out of securing people's material well-being at any level? You secure people's material well-being by reducing regulations, getting out of the way, letting them why can why can't black women braid each other's hair for money without you know a, a licensing that takes two hundred hours to complete? Mm-hmm. I I would say that <clears throat> that does more to keep people down. So yes, absolutely. Um, children and the mentally infirm and veterans, which by the way they had single payer and that didn't work out for them. The Bureau of Indian Affairs they don't do so well with single payer. But in terms of we're going to make an environment. Again, where trust can flourish. When you go into South American countries, which have no American tradition of a free market economy, and you make enterprise zones 
where companies know that the rug isn't going to be pulled out from under them. I mean, Gavin Newsom right now in California just declared, hey, a lot of you are leaving. You know what we're going to do? We're going to tax you for the assets that you had and you're taking. How do you do that? Remember so that the economic floor has to be um, an environment where people understand what the government is doing. Got it. Lydia, I do have a Hollywood question for you, but Lydia, go ahead and uh, respond. Okay, however you one like last to. thing I want to say about yeah. this. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the last two big economic crashes were under two Republican presidents. This could be called a third because of Trump's mishandling of the COVID crisis. But Reagan, 1987, Black Monday was a horrific economy crashed. And under Bush in 2008, it's they don't run government very well because what they do is try to vote against government. No government. And I don't think it's fair that Trump reversed all the toxic waste dumping laws to, to please big business. Trickle down economics never worked. I remember when Bush cut the corporate tax rate again, Trump cut it even more and cut regulations. But when Bush did it, it didn't trickle down. It didn't provide jobs. They hoarded the wealth because they were scared. The wealthiest corporations hoarded the wealth. It didn't create jobs. There are, if there were jobs, if only we could start a new industry of helping each other, collaborating, you know, maybe reducing rents so people can get a leg up and get a start in life. A lot of, and I don't know if you've ever had, a, I have a lot of black male friends who say they are scared to death. Whenever they get in their car, they always, if they're pulled over, they risk dying. I don't feel that way. My little brother was a victim of police brutality because he's belligerent in Denver to the cops and they beat him to a pulp and he lost his spleen. And he had, to, he was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. These were oh two very God. bad cops, mm -hmm. and they. I never told the story publicly yet because it's very. My brother died a few years later. Mm -hmm. He was drunk, reading my father's death, coming mm -hmm. back and following me out to Hollywood, and he lost his life a few years later. But he had no spleen. He lost his spleen. He won a huge settlement, not that big, thirty-two thousand dollars from the Denver grand jury because these were bad cops. They like to beat up people who talk back to them. We have to realize that not all cops are bad. There's only maybe two or three out of a hundred. Maybe, no, two or three out of thousands. But we have to stop cancel culture and blaming each other for everything. There's nuance in between all this. We're, there are good people. And I don't believe these Black Lives Matter, the people that are arsonists and anarchists are all, I don't think they're the protesters at all. They're the ones that come in to agitate, to make everyone else suffer and to hijack the cause. Mm. So that's mm. a little bit of my two cents worth on. Um, yeah, I'm, that's a horrible story about your brother, but it's still... It just goes to show the power of the state is awesome and horrible and awesome, not in a valley girl way, but, you know, yeah. in a God fearing. And Thank you. Because I'm from a country that's majority black. In fact, we got over twice the number of slaves from West Africa that the U.S. did. And we're this big. Um, all wow. our cops are black. And guess what? You don't mess with them because when the power of the state is behind a person with a gun, you comply. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just. It's it's how it works, and so no, I, I, I'm I'm there. There is no black man who is scared for his life just in the act of handing over his license and registration and saying. But they they are. I mean, they they literally drive. Let's one guy gets stopped right here in a limousine. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I so I've certainly had experiences with police officers and I've talked about this publicly where I have, you know, it seemed to me that I've been treated differently by police officers in, you know, in uh, in the San Fernando Valley, as opposed to the way I've been treated by police officers outside of the, the, the projects in Watts. Right. And I think that there's it, it becomes a complicated question because yeah. there is uh, and we don't need to go into this in, in full detail. Um but I feel like there is a reality um, in inner city communities uh, frequently where, you know, it is true. You look at statistics, there are higher incidences of crime rates. There are higher incidences of, you know, all of these sorts of things that police officers are in a position to where they need to they need to be active. They need to police. But because of that, you also have a tendency to profile. You have a tendency to stereotype perhaps the part of law enforcement, which catches a, a, perhaps a majority of innocent people uh, in its mm. in its net. And then, of course, you have to ask the larger question, to what degree uh, do we have? On the one hand, of course, there is a, a need for for community uh, and, and cultural uh, self-sufficiency, independence, taking responsibility for action, so on and so forth. But to what degree are the problems in the inner city community also related to what you can call structural systemic factors? Part of my frustration with American politics is that 
regardless of what the answer to these questions are, we need to have a conversation that allows us to swim through the nuance so we can get to whatever the clear truth is. And that's what I don't see happening. And where I think you two can shine a little bit of light on something important for us is in identifying Hollywood's kind of role and impact mm. on the larger conversation. Because Roxanne, it's not just the state that has massive power as an as a cultural or as an institutional force in American life. The entertainment industry, I think most folks would argue, seems oh. to have a massive influence on how we speak, I, how yeah. we feel, how we think. Now, just to set it up, um, if you go back in time, I, you know, I, I, it seems pretty clear to me that Hollywood played a role, played a real role uh, during the civil rights movement and in in the sort of the lead up to the social changes that happened that time in sort of priming the pump for the American people to be more tolerant of each other across, across racial lines. And, you know, I mean, yeah. you, you look at the films from, from Charlton Heston to even John, some John Wayne's movies, Sidney Poitier mm -hmm. and so forth. You can see right. the shift in social sentiments taking place with regard to race and Hollywood actors, Marlon Brando, Mark Hitching with Dr. Uh, artists, yes, thank you, Lydia. Artists hold a mirror right. up to society. Right. And what I love about the but, but, but just 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 to round out the point, I'm sorry, oh, Lydia, but just to round out the okay. point, you can look at that history, and it's like, okay, I, Hollywood seemed to be a force for for social progress, and I think many many artists and 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 actors, uh, actors and actresses. See, here's me tripping over the rules, now. Please forgive me. <laughs> Um, are, are, are also trying to sort of, you know, they're saying, okay, this is the stand we're taking today in the same type of cause. But many folks and certainly many conservatives look at Hollywood today as really flanning the flames of sort of anti-conservative uh, bigotry, anti-Christian bigotry, so on and so forth. And so that's just my big setup. Lydia, how do you evaluate kind of the role and influence well, of Hollywood today? All along, back in the, when I was um, thinking about Hollywood a lot, I thought the Hollywood liberal ideology is these beautiful movies, the real artists in Hollywood hold a mirror up to society. And we want to create art, work of art, like you said, Sidney Poitier, movies that change your mind, change hearts and minds. Mm. That's what most liberal movie making is about. It kind of softly goes against the bad guy and it teaches you lessons about how to treat your fellow man. All the great movies have done that and great TV shows. But now here's where I'm going to disagree with you. Hollywood. You, 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 there's two sects in Hollywood. There's the artist, then there's the corporate culture that wants to make a buck at all costs. Hmm. I equate them to the Instagram butt models. I can't believe I came up in a time <laughs> where I was like considered <laughs> sexy wearing a bikini poster. And now these girls are actually all day long showing their butts <laughs> and their waistline and their Kim Kardashian. Hmm. This is such sleazy, trashy, not classy. I, I don't mean to judge, but I'm saying... This is Just not the way I want us. my daughters to be raised. <laughs> I'm very prudish when it comes to this. And and at the same time, I want romance to come back. I want men and women to flirt again. I mm -hmm. want them not to be canceling each other in the office. Office romance, you know, flirt a little. Why is it always, we've mm -hmm. gone overcorrected. Mm -hmm. We've overcorrected like the stock market does at times. Mm -hmm. I know we're going to find a happy pendulum someday, but I really feel the artists can save humanity and we need to start cherishing each other's point of view like you said if only we'd have a leader sit down and say the black lives matter and the police sit down together let's talk about each other let's talk about our personal stories tell me your story we can do it through storytelling but the leader should be doing this he should be saying god i never thought about the fact that this man was shot in the back or jacob blake that must have been a horrible feeling to have your loved one killed even if he had a domestic violence record that doesn't he doesn't deserve to be shot and then we to show the humanity of the person who was shot, show his story. If a leader sat down and said, let's bring both sides together right now. I want the police to talk to Black Lives Matter. Get your issues out. We'll do it in every city. We would have a better world. We need to talk to each other and see that we're not the enemy. We're not the boogeyman. You know, um, there are these crazy extremists on both sides and they don't have a, they should not have a place in this conversation. You, my best friend in the world is Trump's biggest supporter. She went to campaign for him in Vegas when he first got elected. I, she's a conundrum because mm -hmm. she loves the environment, only dates black men. And, but she is, you know, I don't know. I don't know what her issue is, but we love each other. We love each other. We've had fights and we hug and make up. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, so. Roxanne, Lydia just said a, said a number of things kind of describing kind of this. She, she mentioned the corporatist versus artist 
uh, paradox in Hollywood. I don't know if uh, if you see it that way. I'm imagining there are a few things Lydia said that you might want to respond to, but dig into the Hollywood piece for us a bit, if you will. How is Hollywood influencing, you know, the way in which we think and feel and communicate uh, as Americans? Well, what's fascinating about Hollywood and, and actors, and I can say this because I am one, hmm. is just how incredibly self-centered we are. And <laughs> we, I love being a storyteller. But when we often hold up that mirror to the world, but think that we are the world at the same time. So, for example, integration really, where it really got going in this country, what really made things change and move forward was the armed services. The armed services integrated and moved forward. And then, you know, we played the armed services on TV and thought that we did something. And, and sharing the <laughs> message is important. But even as Bill Whittle will say, every movie is conservative. And James Bond is rolling up in his individual uh, Aston Martin with his individual gun and dispatching with the bad guy. He's not sending a strongly worded memo written by a committee um, and all singing Kumbaya. They're like getting the shit done. Excuse my language. Um, but what is fascinating about Hollywood, and I'll disagree with you a little bit, Lydia, it's not Victoria's Secret. It is keeping up with the Kardashians that has just been, to me, the complete, complete destruction of the country because it symbolized a race to the bottom. I remember, I don't want to, I got off my lawn. I'm old enough to remember when people aspired to, you know, one day, you know, wearing a glamorous gown and a tuxedo and going somewhere. And now I want to show my bedazzled thong to the masses. I mean, how, how is anyone speaking to looking at Cardi B and not thinking anything other than that's a dumbass stripper? Like, I'm sorry, like that's a dumbass stripper with some cool songs, but really. Um, and I think my story that really encapsulates Hollywood and what is We may happened. get some angry emails from some Cardi I B like fans. I like Cardi B. That's okay. Yeah, me, That's okay. You got a, Car Cardi B, you've got a fan in, in, in Lydia here. Um, just, just just so you're not bouncing it out. Okay, That's I'm okay. sorry. If your going. fingernails are too long to wipe your butt, I'm not going to listen to you. Oh, um, so <laughs> <laughs> I judge. I'm, I'm a judge. Um, <laughs> but I did. I used to do a series of... Um, sort of round table producer readings for, for writers and they would bring in a script. And so a group of actors would read their script so that they could, you know, sort of see how it was coming out. And this one writer came and he brought two scripts and I, uh, you know, you get to sign up for the reading and I didn't sign up for the first one because I'm a mom and I'm also approved Lydia. And I have, you know, I, I want my children to think honorable things about me. And the first script was a half hour all about, the porn biz and not like the sanitized porn biz like they used i can't even like the c word like words that i just they're not gonna come out of my mouth consider um, this podcast to be like pg-13 rated oh, so it, if you guys oh, are trying to figure that so out <laughs> made for like cable it, it was disgusting but the guy had met a adult performer also known as a kid who was molested by some family member and now is an adult performer. Um, and, you know, he was really, he had really done the research and it was about that world, which like was disgustingly scummy. They read the script, they had notes for him. They were, nobody said anything like, hey, this is disgustingly scummy. Like this is so scummy, it smells bad. Like then the second script came up and it was also a half hour script. And it was, I, I think, pretty loosely based on Larry Elder. And it was a conservative black talk show host here in California. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the yeah, joke, yeah. his, um, this guy, conservatives, it was sort of a little bit of a Frasier takeoff, right? Like, so his producer um, was uh, this sort of no holds barred gangbuster, you know, black woman who's a lesbian. It turns out to be his daughter. Like, ooh. So it was, all, it was, a, it was a funny, like that one could actually be on a network because there was no yeah. various words that I can't say. <laughs> so I read in that one. And at the end, when it came time for notes, and this is again, back when Mitt Romney was a Nazi, it was the vitriol from the actors about how dare you normalize this freak show conservative. He's just a conservative. He literally believes that government doesn't do things as efficiently as the private sector. That's what 
a, a conservative is. And they wouldn't give notes. It's a 15 person round table about what was funny, what worked, what didn't work. Um, they just wanted to focus on how dare you normalize someone who doesn't think the way we do. Mm. And wow. though Lydia is, and, and so many of my liberal friends and my entire liberal family um, are good people, I get, I get the feeling. I understand the shame of, oh my God, my party is being taken over by whack jobs. Because though you don't like Antifa, though you don't think they speak for you, and while you think BLM is a benign movement, it is a Marxist Complete no, no. rent movement that is bent no. on the destruction of the nuclear black family, no. which is how we got here. No, um, no, no. Let me right. just that's just that's that one thing. Not the movement is what you were talking about, but no. everyone's Who? kowtowing to the movement and moving hundreds of millions Roxanne. of dollars into a group right. that is destructive. Well, Actually, Black Lives Matter was founded by three women on behalf of mothers who'd lost their sons to unarmed, who were shot in the back. Their sons. This was heartbroken mothers. Trayvon Martin's mother. Platform. That it's it's sad. It was hijacked. It has been hijacked by a fringe element, but that is only in the news to create chaos right now. The true no, movement. Was, Roxanne, who gets the money, Lydia. Yeah, let, let, who let's, gets the Roxanne, let's. Uh, I hear you, Roxanne. Let's let Lydia. Uh, let's let Lydia uh, make make her point. Go ahead, Lydia. Well, I I really. Oh my God, my heart breaks. I I've been praying all week for. Now I'm not a. Um, evangelical Christian, but I've I found God in a very personal way. And I call it God, this force of love that unites mm -hmm. us, yeah. that we need to focus on our, our, we need to find common ground. And I really, it's, it's stressful for me around Trump because every day I, I, and I shouldn't do this, but my, his caregiver didn't wear a mask on the 4th of July weekend. She was a member of a Filipino Trump support group and they're immigrants who are very strong and they follow the leader. And she brought 14 days to the day she came down with COVID. She was coughing in the house. My stepfather had dementia. He was fine a few days earlier. He died three days later. And then my mother was tested positive for COVID. My mother finally tested negative a month later and the whole house cleared out. We lost our entire caregiving team, everything, the financial support of my mother. We're cobbling it together again, but I have to say, there's a lot of lies going around and a lot of like, we're fighting each other and we're not listening to each other. Black Lives Matter started as a group of women mothers on behalf of their sons being killed for no reason. Driving while black, being black, trigger hippie, trigger happy cops that have been trained to shoot. I've seen them shoot white people also. It's, it's, it's almost like the training is to kill rather than to just to, to protect and serve. We should soften our, our rhetoric. We should come down to a level where we can see each other clearly. I agree. Black Lives Matter has been hijacked by this fringe element. And Trump has been hijacked by an extreme right-wing element. And the only real domestic terror organization labeled as domestic terror is white supremacists. There are many white supremacist groups, including KKK. This has been a chronic problem in America. If you look at the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence since 2008, there are over 1,700 right-wing hate crimes, including provoked by media. Glenn Beck once yelled, Obama's gonna get your guns. He said it on national TV, Obama's coming to get your guns. A young man in Philadelphia stood by his front door with all his guns. His mother called the cops, she was scared. She shot the cops as soon as they entered. This has been a, a, a very bad system of provocation. We're doing it to each other through the media or through our own social media. And um, regarding Hollywood, I, I kind of agree with you. I don't even, I never allow the F word in my house. I feel like I'm an anomaly. I agree with you on that experience you had. That's horrifying to me. I would definitely want to see the other show. I would like to see two people work out their differences and see another person profiled. And I'm sorry you've been ostracized in Hollywood because of pol politics. You know, I worked with Kelsey Grammer on, a, on an entire, I, had a, I accidentally moved my stalker into my house because we had, both had the same stalker. And I was mistaken for a hooker by my mother and the police on my way to an entourage audition once. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I had to wear a dog collar and a leash. <laughs> right. So I'm writing a whole whole book about Hollywood horror stories called Hiding My Brain in My Bra. And it's, it's I oh. feel like a prude in Hollywood. And I agree with you. The entertainment industry has gone too far. 
and we're also too obsessed with violence. And I would let my kid buy a video game called Bomberman. He resents me to this day because why didn't you let me have that game? I went, it just didn't seem right after after the World Trade Centers, you know, were bombed mm. to buy a game called Bomberman. I don't know. Mm. I think Lydia, I want to say we're so sorry about your stepfather. And there's look, there's in yeah, a country yeah. of 350 million people, there are jerks, there are idiots, there are incorrigible people they're mentally unstable people there's a lot of mentally unstable people and why i interrupted and pushed back about blm is because it doesn't matter that it was started by three women no matter how mm. well their intention they were and i'm not quite sure about that what it is now is a marxist front group funneling huge amounts of money into the election into the destruction of america and so that's mm. what matters now and why we got Trump, and what I'll, I'll say again, he, the most important thing to know is, do you know how many white supremacists that, because they track them, are in America? Are what? And, and you gotta count all the, you gotta count all the like ATF infiltrators, whatever. So at last count, there were about 8,000 people who identify as white supremacists in the United States of America. Who would admit it? Who would admit it? From Timothy no, McVeigh on, based, survivalist. Yeah, this is, eight, okay, well, you're saying that it's been, encouraged and right so people admit people admit all sorts of things 10 percent of americans think elvis is still alive so you gotta <laughs> remember that right mm -hmm. but what's fascinating i is saw him the, the other day you invention know? of the bronies got twelve thousand attendees do you know what bronies are they are adult men usually who dress up as my little ponies they're like a subsection of furries they're very <laughs> furries are people. weird yes <laughs> they're, okay they're, they're, now you're gonna get mail but the fact is, there, I have are, <laughs> there are, of course, there are nutballs, but it shouldn't be called crazy to do the things that President Trump is doing, not talking about doing, which is reducing regulation, um, increasing a, a public-private partnership, the likes of which we've never seen to get out testing and to, to create oh, uh, no. for a vaccine. I mean, those things, and not to mention Mitty's piece. In other words, we have to, it is incumbent on us to realize that politicians, by and large, and I tried to be one, and I'm working on a book called L Lessons from a Loser, mm. um, about not running and not winning, but they don't want to solve problems. Why, why do people, why are they in Congress or in the Senate for 30, yeah. 40, 50 years? Like they literally don't want to solve problems. And Wait, when you, that's horrifying to me. Hmm. When so you Lydia, say Lydia Roxanne, Lydia Roxanne, I'm, I'm so, I'm so sorry. We are coming up, uh, coming up on our time. And one thing I would love to be able to do is get a round two on the books with the two of you <laughs> at some yeah, point because definitely. you two have so much to talk about and uh, I love this. this there's is so really lightning. There's so much wonderful passion and energy between you guys. And, and and honestly, I would love to also do a, a true Hollywood stories episode for Braver Angels yeah. too. We've never done that, so if that's a thing, uh, we can uh, you know we can look at that. Uh, you can do as, a lightning as, round as with we like get hundred people. Oh yeah, that'd be yeah, fun, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So Roxanne, really quick, because I want to give Lydia a minute to talk to to tell us about her book project too, because I think that I think listeners are going to find it going to find it very relevant. And of course, Roxanne, as your book jumps from your jumps from your brain uh, onto the paper, we're going to bring you back on to talk about that as well, right? Um, but um, Roxanne, do you have uh, any sort of closing wisdom or advice to folks listening to this podcast who are left, right, and center, right? Um, in terms of how we can go about sort of recovering our ability to uh, to communicate yeah. with each other. And I know, Lydia, that you're writing about this, so I'll get your take next. But Roxanne, do you have some closing words to offer there? I would just say the most important gift we have is that of perspective. Hitler was Hitler. Pol Pot was Pol Pot. Um, Mao was Mao. I mean, what we have in America is not that. We do not have fascism. We have a president that some people don't like. And we will always have a president that about half the people don't like and don't vote for. And we just have to remember that we're all on the same team. The United States of America is the greatest country that God has ever created. And people lash together empty milk cartons to go across shark infested waters to get here. Let's just all be friends. 
Hard, hard, hard to imagine that Roxanne didn't manage to win the first time being able to give a speech like that. Roxanne, are you gonna <laughs> yeah, try? Really? Are you gonna try it again, Roxanne? Are you uh, you don't have yes. to answer that, but <laughs> I'd like to stay married. So, okay, no. <laughs> there you go. All right. Okay, and Lydia. Mm -hmm. Oh, so so Lydia, Lydia, tell us uh, tell us about what you're working on. And yeah, you know, same same fundamental question to you. How can we restore our ability to treat each other as you know as as neighbors and as fellow human beings again here in the United States of America? Well, I learned the hard way too. I raised three boys and two dogs, including my husband, and they all went through puberty at the same time. So I had a house of, I was raising aliens, living with a Neanderthal, and I had to learn <laughs> to find the good in the other. And I think the most spiritual growth happens with your enemy, mm. but most people don't get that. And that's, that's what I do admire what's going on in the Middle East right now. I'm very proud of, this is a great thing, um, to create peace. I have some things that I know about, you know, President Trump, because I've known him. I've known his ex-wife, Ivana, Ivana <laughs> in Monte Carlo years ago. And I've heard just things about the Trump University fraud and the way he caused the suicide of a contractor. He wouldn't pay the bills on his buildings. And it's just he got lots of breaks because he had the corporate. He, he had the elite ability to keep borrowing money from Deutsche Bank and different banks, which the common man doesn't have. The middle class doesn't have. I think we need to see the good in each other. And I love the USA, I love America, but I do think Colin Kaepernick kneeling in a basketball game or in a football field, <laughs> did I say basketball? <laughs> did I say that? I think kneeling was the softer way. That's what we fought, that's what my grandfather went fought in World War II for, our ability to protest peacefully. And to that's what the flag represents, free speech, the ability to say whatever you want, freedom of religion. And so if we stop blaming each other and coloring each other with these terrible labels, mm -hmm. we've got to stop labeling. We've got to come together and, and talk and dialogue like we're doing right now. And I really have this beautiful hope. And I had this thing in my marriage vows, in the presence of true love, anything unlike love comes up to be seen first to be healed. It's like a volcano or a pimple. It, it has to explode <laughs> to create new land. We are creating new land right now. Mm. And it may be ugly for a while, but we will, we're will. we not gonna have a French Revolution like the Miserable. We're going to have a great peace at the end of all this. And we all have to stop seeing our fellow man as the enemy. Mm. God bless America. Indeed. Uh, so Braver Angels right now is in, uh, we're in the middle of our uh, Braver Angels 2020 campaign. And we're focused on this idea that the American people need to be able to fight right right? That we need to be able to completely and authentically engage each other over our differences while still being able to move from a spirit of goodwill for each other as fellow Americans and as neighbors. And I think that the two of you <laughs> managed to do that in spectacular conversation, in spectacular fashion in this conversation. And uh, I'm sure that we'll all be looking forward to more. So Roxanne beckford Hogue, Lydia Cornell, thank you both so much for being here with us today. And uh, really, truly a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank uh, you, Lydia. Thank you, Roxanne. I love meeting you. I can't wait to have more of these conversations. And thank you, John. All great work you're doing. 100%. And so for, for folks listening, if you are interested in the project of building out the connections and the bonds and the community that is the relationships between the American people, if you see this as work that is worth supporting and being involved in, join us as a member. Braver Angels is a membership organization. We have local communities across the country uh, at BraverAngels.org. Like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. Uh, and as always, we are building a house united. Until next time, thank you so much.